Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Chanel Hasten. I am the Director of Outreach and Community Relations for the Alaka Alliance here in Oregon. And tonight's presentation is diving into a changing ecosystem. Um, Kelp Forest and Urchin Barrens with Kate Villette and Dr. Josh Smith. So I'm going to give a little overview of the Alaka Alliance and who we are and then pass it off to our wonderful guest speakers this evening. So sea otters have a long legacy here in Oregon and pretty much for the entire west coast for that matter. Uh, for at least 10,000 years sea otters were an important part of the culture of the people along Oregon's coastlines. There is therefore a very strong cultural heritage connection to the Oregon Coast tribes. And as you can see here, there uh, definitely were a lot of sea otters on our coastline because there are multiple different ways of pronouncing sea otter in different indigenous languages. So the Alaka Alliance, I'll give you a little history of how we came to be. The late David Hatch is a Siletz tribal member of the Ku Sayusla and Aleut descent. And he was searching for an indigenous name for a sailing dinghy that he and his son Peter were building in their living room. And he found the word Alaka, which means sea otter and Chinook jargon dictionary. So this chance uh, led him down a path of activism to raise awareness to everyday Oregonians and scientists alike about the extirpation of sea otters from Oregon, their key ecological role and the possibility of their return. So he gathered a lot of people and inspired them and therefore the Alaka Alliance was born. Um, so our mission is to restore a healthy population of sea otters on the Oregon coast and in the process help make Oregon's marine ecosystem more robust and resilient. We are very lucky uh, to have some amazing individuals on our board of directors, all from tribal backgrounds, nonprofit and conservation leaders, all with the same aligned mission to return sea otters to the Oregon coast. So we are currently in the process of putting the final touch, touches on a complex feasibility study and economic impact assessment covering all the things involved, the pros and cons of a possible sea otter reintroduction. And we're going to publish these findings in the next several months on our website for public comment and review. And therefore, if a consensus is reached, across multiple stakeholders on restoration, we will, if warranted, therefore, move on and proceed with restoration uh, along the Oregon coast at uh, carefully chosen locations. If you want to stay in the know with our latest updates, uh, check us out online, the Alaka Alliance, or www.alakaalliance.org. Sign up for our newsletter that we send out once a month. We're on all your favorite social media channels, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube, which you can find this video on uh, tomorrow once I post it. Do you want to rewatch all the amazingness? So I am very honored to invite Kate and Josh to speak with us this evening. I had seen a previous presentation of theirs and felt uh, there are numerous similarities between what's happening, what's happening in Northern California marine ecosystem, ecosystems and what's also happening here in Oregon, uh, minus the presence of sea otters, of course, in terms of urchin barrens and decreasing kelp forests. And Kate does a really beautiful job of showcasing the ecological shifts in her photography and Josh ties it all together by backing it with scientific evidence. So I'll let them give their proper introductions. Um, so I'm going to pass it off to Kate to start us off. Hi, everyone. I'll get this thing up and started here for you. All right, how's that looking? 
looks great. All right. So hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us tonight. Um, I'm Kate Vilet. I'm a underwater photographer and scientific diver based in Monterey Bay, California. And uh, Josh and I are here to take you on a dive into the kelp forest in Monterey Bay and just show you how the kelp forests look down here and how they've been changing over recent years. So off the coast of, off the Pacific coast, we have this underwater ecosystem called the kelp forest. And I'm assuming most of you are very familiar with this ecosystem, but for anyone who isn't, it's kind of an ecosystem analogous to coral reefs in the sense that it's created by a foundation species. But instead of coral, this one's created by kelp. And when you think of kelp, you probably think of probably the most famous large kelp that is around and is dominant in Monterey. And that is this guy, and this is giant kelp. And this guy will grow from the bottom of the reef all the way up to the surface and just spread out all over the surface and just absorb the sun. Um, and when they all come together, they create this really thick forest. Uh, it's kind of like an underwater rainforest. It creates habitat for all sorts of life and great diversity in this habitat. And so some of the life you might find in the kelp forest off California here are things like these blue rockfish, which hang out in these big schools on the surface. Uh, jellies, this is a Pacific sea nettle hanging out in the kelp forest, and these guys will come in big blooms that will show up every couple years. Lots of different crustaceans. Uh, this is a decorated crab, and these guys will actually cover themselves in little bits and pieces of invertebrates and algae to camouflage. All sorts of fish. If you do any fishing, you're probably familiar with this guy. This is a lingcod. They're these large fish that are elongate ambush predators. Every crack and crevice in the kelp forest is occupied by something or another. In this case, this is a monkey face prickleback, which is this elongate eel-like fish that's tucked in a crack here. Kelp rockfish. This is a very common rockfish in California. You see them on essentially every dive. They camouflage really well in the kelp, and sometimes they'll hang upside down in the algae too. This is a cabazon. This is a very large sculpin, and uh, the males will actually protect their eggs, and that's what's going on here. The male is guarding his eggs under a giant kelp. If you do any tide pooling, you're probably familiar with this guy. This is an ochre sea star, and they're found in the intertidal as well as in kelp forests. They're known for eating mussels, but in this case, this guy is eating some barnacles. And there are all sorts of tiny little creatures in the kelp forest, too. This is a little shrimp. There are worms all over the reef. Um, this looks like a feather, but it's actually the head of a worm. And that's the part of its body, its head, where that it uses to actually eat as well as um, breathe. And they'll just stick out of the reef like this. They're actually really pretty, even though worms are usually pretty overlooked in the reef. And everyone's favorite marine invertebrate, the nudibranch. Super colorful little sea slugs. This is an opalescent nudibranch, very common in Monterey. Tiny little fish, for every single big fish you see, there's countless teeny little fish that occupy the reef. This is a yellowfin fringe head. It's only about as big as your pinky finger, but um, you'll find them hiding crack in little cracks and crevices on the reef. And you'll find little cool critters up in the water column too. This is a little uh, red eye medusa that was floating in the water catching things with its tentacles. It was only about an inch and a half tall or so. So all these little critters that are make up the reefscape also attract topside visitors like cormorants and cormorants will actually dive into the kelp forest to catch fish. And uh, sometimes if you're lucky, they'll actually take a moment to check you out too while they're at it. And then of course, there's the other main character of the story besides kelp and that is the purple sea urchin, which is a native species of sea urchin found on the Pacific coast and they're found throughout the kelp forest. And so all of this life comes together to create this really incredibly diverse ecosystem. And that diversity is really reflected on the color of the reef. If you take a look at the reefscape, all that color is alive. It's things like sponges, tunicates, bryozoans, anemones, snails, slugs. There, there's all sorts of life on the reef. And there's no such thing as bare rock almost in a kelp forest, just because there's so much competition for every square inch of rock space. 
And uh, sea urchins are part of this too. You can see these guys are jammed in the cracks and that's because they prefer to hang out in cracks and catch algae as it drifts by. And so this is what your typical kelp forest reefscape looks like, but things start to change around 2013, 2014. Josh will go into way more detail about this in his research, but essentially we started experiencing a sea star wasting event and some marine heat waves. And this started to cause the ecosystem to shift from this kind of a view to something like this. And this is what's known as an urchin barren. And as the name sounds, it's an ecosystem that is dominated by urchins. And here it's the purple sea urchin that is the predominant urchin involved in this. And you can see there's just not as much color on this reefscape. There's not as much diversity. It's mostly just the urchins and that pink stuff, which is crustos and articulated coralline, which are these calcareous red algae. So there's there's a ton of life in this ecosystem, but it's not as diverse and it's it's very different from a kelp forest. And so this shift happens because the urchins are actually very hungry and they'll eat all the kelp. And they do this with these little teeth that they have. This is actually the underside of an urchin and that white bit in the center is its teeth. And they use those teeth to even gnaw through rock. They're self-sharpening and they can carve little cubbies for themselves in the reef. And they like to hang out in that and hide in that. And of course, those teeth are also really good at chewing kelp, which is their favorite food. And so in these urchin barrens, you won't find much algae left. They'll have basically any algae looks kind of like this, where it's just covered in urchins and being devoured. And eventually it just sort of looks like this, where there's essentially no algae left and just maybe these stipes that takes the urchin a little longer to chew through that are left. So this is what it looks like in Carmel Bay. If you go around the corner to Monterey Bay, it's much the same kind of a site where the urchins are just dogpiling on whatever kelp is left. This is a holdfast of a giant kelp, which is the root-like structure of the kelp that holds it down to the reef. And what the urchins have done here is chewed away the stipes so there's nothing left except for the holdfast and they're just devouring it because there's nothing else left. And so you'll dive through this ecosystem and there'll just be this wall of urchin. And as soon as that front hits some kelp, they kind of devour it like they're doing here. And they just keep eating everything until there's essentially nothing left. And they'll get to the point where there's nothing and they're starving and they just will actually scrape the rock clean. So you'll get these patches of bare rock in between in the urchin barrens. They're just so hungry and they have nothing left to eat. And so as this has been occurring and we've seen the loss of the giant kelp disappearing, which is the dominant kelp here in Monterey, we've started to see more of this guy. And this is probably something, if you go along the Oregon coast, you're more familiar with. This is uh, bull kelp. And it usually gets outcompeted by giant kelp here. Um, you can see this guy is underneath the canopy of a giant kelp, which is just shading it. But we've seen more of these guys start to crop up as this shift has been occurring. And so they start out as these little guys at the bottom of the ocean and they'll grow all the way up to the top until they look like this. And this was one individual of a little forest that just cropped up in Monterey. It was a forest that used to be a giant kelp forest and kind of got replaced by bull kelp um, in repeated years. And so just to show you how dense these guys get, this is a little patch of baby bull kelp from last year that cropped up in Carmel. And so you can see just how thick these little forests of bull kelp get. Not all of these guys necessarily survive, but even so they can get pretty dense. And these were actually taken last year, but this year we've had a really good recruitment of both baby bull kelp and baby giant kelp that showed up this spring. And a lot of them are almost at the surface now. So hopefully a bunch of those survive to become new kelp forest. So the other interesting thing we've seen here and the other interesting dynamic we've seen particularly here in the central coast is this patchwork of kelp forest and urchin barren. And that's different from say the north coast of California where it's just generally solid urchin barren. And so you can see in this image, there's that thick kelp forest in the background and the solid urchin barren in the front. And yet they kind of coexist. It's been like this for years. They, the urchin barren never takes over as you might expect. So you'll be in an area that's basically like this, where it's just urchin barren and any kelp is being dominated by the urchins and will soon be gone. Then you swim a little inshore and you get something like this, which is that you still have that diversity going on here, 
but there's still that kelp forest and everything and a lot of urchins, but everything's kind of holding. Then you go a little more shallow and you get that beautiful shallow kelp forest where there's all this algae, brown algae, red algae, seagrasses all together and no urchins essentially, except maybe a few. And then you swim a little deeper and you get something like this, that classic giant kelp forest of Monterey where it's so, the canopy is so thick, it's practically a night dive and the only light are these beams that pierce through. And so I'm showing you these particular five images because they're all taken at the same site on the same day. So they really illustrate just how much of this patchwork is going on even in a small area. This is again really different from say the north coast where they've just had solid urchin barren and almost no kelp left. And so Josh again will his research is really awesome looking into exactly this thing and he'll go into much more detail. But part of a major reason why this is happening here on the central coast is because of everyone's favorite little sea weasel and that is the sea otter, um, this little guy diving into the kelp forest and they have allowed the, some of these patches of kelp forest to survive. Um, due to their influence in the kelp forest. And I actually took these photos two weeks ago. I've been diving in the kelp forest of Monterey for almost 10 years now. And this is the first time I got a picture of a sea otter. So you guys kind of lucked out to get this guy in the presentation to see what they look like um, in the kelp forest. So now that I've showed you all these uh, images of kelp forest and urchin barren, it probably gives the impression that uh, the kelp forest is this alive three-dimensional ecosystem and the urchin barren is just dead. And that's not exactly true. It's a bit more complicated than that. The urchin barren is quite alive in its own right. So I'm gonna show you a little video right here real quick to show you what they actually look like when they, they're sped up. So this right here is a leather star in an urchin barren. And the urchins you can see are really reactive to its presence. It's about a 30 minute time lapse. And so you can see just how much movement is going on. And that's because the leather star is actually a predator of the urchin and the urchins know it and they run away or they become super defensive. So you can see that going on. But aside from that, you can, might also notice, it might, it's probably blocky on your end, but if you look really closely between all of that, there's a lot of movement between. There are chitons, worms, barnacles, slugs, uh, hermit crabs, snails, sculpins, all sorts of little critters that live in these uh, ecosystems. So even though they're not as diverse as kelp forests, they are very alive in their own right, and they're very um, rich in all these marine invertebrates. So usually when people see these images, they want to know what is being done about the situation and if there's any research and work being done. And I can assure you there's a lot of research into this. This is a hot topic right now for sure in the marine biology realm. And this is an example of one of the experiments that is going on in Monterey. So this was uh, an experiment being run by Reef Check in Pacific Grove that the Reef Check Foundation, which is an organization I work for, they do marine conservation and kelp forest monitoring work. And in this case, they were the experiment was about removing a specific set of urchins from these sets of reef and seeing if the kelp would return. And uh, this experiment went on for a few years and uh, an off branch kind of continued it just started in Tankers Reef in Monterey, and that's a multi-organizational um, project that's going on right now just to remove urchins from this one reef by volunteers. And then Reef Check goes in there and measures and sees if the kelp comes back essentially in that site. So there's lots of experiments going on. There's another experiment on the North Coast. There are experiments in the South Coast and all sorts of research being done into this. And if you're a diver at all, these, this is a great way to get involved if you're interested in getting involved. All of this was volunteer citizen scientists powered, including the new project at Tankers Reef. And Reef Check actually just expanded up to the Oregon for their kelp forest monitoring work. So even if you're based in Oregon, there are ways to get involved in citizen science work. In that case, it would be kelp forest monitoring or in California, this kind of work or actual uh, kelp forest monitoring that we have here. And so I just want to finish up by saying, I think these images are very emotional when people see the, 
these urchin barons just overtaking the kelp forest and it makes people sad of course and um, and the, it's hard for people to connect with these urchins because they're these weird spiky alien balls. They're hard for us to empathize with. They're not cute and cuddly like sea otters. And so we tend to take away that, oh, urchins are evil, urchins are bad, but urchins are a native part of this ecosystem. They are as important in this ecosystem as sea otters, as the kelp itself. And so just remember that they are not the problem. The problem is the changing environment and the urchins are just reacting the way they need to react to survive just like everything else and as long as climate change keeps changing these environments they will act how they need to survive so we should really look at ourselves before we blame the urchins and what we can do about our own impact on this ecosystem and the world's ecosystems and that's all i have for you tonight um, this is a little bit of contact info if anyone wants to follow up on anything and as well as reef checks info in case anyone is interested, you can go to the website and see if there's uh, any more info or if you want to contact them. And I'll, after that, I'll hand it off to Josh to uh, take over the, all the science with his awesome research. Thanks, Kate. That was awesome. I just want to hop on and remind people if you have questions, I always forget to say in the beginning because I'm too distracted, but to use the Q&A feature and we'll get to them after the presentation. All right, go ahead, Josh, sorry. Thank you. Um, is this, uh, does this look okay? I can't tell if I'm sharing on the right screen here. Um, yes, okay, here. cool. Thanks so much. Um, hi everyone, my name's Josh. Um, I am a marine ecologist and I study kelp forest ecosystems. Um, and I'm gonna kind of pick up uh, here where Kate left off and, and describe some of the science of this changing ecosystem. Uh, but before I get um, too far into this, I just wanna first thank the Alaka Alliance for inviting Kate and myself um, to this webinar today. Um, and also, um, I'm gonna be sharing research um, that is um, both published and also unpublished. Um, and so I just want to acknowledge that there are several individuals who have been involved in this collaborative effort um, over the last decade um, from multiple institutions. Um, so for my portion of the talk, um, there's really two things that I want to focus on. Um, number one, I want to discuss the important role of sea urchin behavior. Um, and so here I'm going to focus on how um, this catastrophic sea star wasting event that, that Kate described actually helped to um, uh, reveal a new understanding about the important role of sea urchin behavior. Um, and then after that, um, I want to talk about how sea otters have responded to the sea urchin outbreak. So I thought I'd start just by mentioning that um, kelp forests grow um, around the world um, along temperate coastlines, and they are known to switch between this forested state of the system um, and what we call this alternative barrens state of the system that is void of kelp and dominated by uh, these, these sea urchin grazers. Um, and we've documented kelp forests switching to barrens and then barrens switching back to forests all over the place around the world. Uh, and kelp is kind of a big deal. Um, you know, as you saw in Kate's photos, um, these forests provide extraordinary biodiversity. And, um, you know, I, I just remembered that there was a study done in Southern California back in the 1970s that identified over 800 species of animals in a Southern California kelp forest. Um, and as you saw in Kate's photos, there are so many animals that are inconspicuous and small and really difficult to find. Um, and so I'm sure since that study has been done, there's, there's, uh, there's even more things out there now. 
Um, and this extraordinary biodiversity is what supports a number of recreational and commercial fisheries. Um, kelp is also fundamentally important in buffering climate change because just like plants on land, kelp takes in CO2. Um, and some of that kelp is eventually ripped out and transported offshore where it sinks down to the deep sea and that carbon is ultimately sequestered in deep sea sediments. And kelp is a foundation species. So um, it, it supports um, the entire forest ecosystem by providing habitat and food. So importantly, the loss of forests then can have devastating impacts on these critical ecological and economic services. And so therefore understanding the mechanisms that either maintain the forested state of the system, that maintain the barren state of the system, or that cause the system to switch between these two states has really important implications for uh, advancing our understanding um, of, the, of the processes that structure kelp forest ecosystems. Um, and so the majority of my talk is gonna focus on kelp forests along the central coast of California. Um, this is our, our primary research location. Um, and in a moment here, I'm gonna discuss some recent changes in California's kelp forests. Um, but I first wanna introduce some of the key characters in the story. So kelp, um, as I just mentioned, is this foundation species and normally in kelp forests, um, kelp is constantly producing and, uh, and, and raining these blades of kelp that um, sink down to the reef surface. And those blades are consumed by sea urchins and other detritivores. Um, we also have a native predator of sea urchins in the system called Pycnopodia or the sunflower sea star. Throughout this talk, I'm gonna call it Pycnopodia. Um, and this is a giant extra large pizza sized sea star that is highly mobile, can cruise around the reef um, and eats sea urchins. And then here on the central coast of California, of course, we also have the Southern sea otter. And so um, all of these animals here are native to this kelp forest. Um, but starting in 2013, things began to really change. As Kate mentioned, in 2013, um, uh, there was this catastrophic sea star wasting event that completely decimated Pycnopodia along with other species of sea stars. Um, but the one thing that I want to point out here is notice that uh, Pycnopodia was never really that abundant to begin with. Um, here in Monterey Bay on the central coast of California, we did not have Pycnopodia um, here to the same extent um, that it occurred much farther north um, in Northern California, in Oregon, and upwards in the, in the BC and Alaska. Um, the relative abundance was much lower here on the Central Coast. So I just want to point that out because later on it's going to become really important. Um, shortly after that sea star wasting event was this marine heat wave. And that marine heat wave was the product of two climatic events. There was this blob of really warm seawater that showed up in the Northeastern Pacific. Um, and there was also a major El Nino event that brought warm water up from the equatorial Pacific. Um, and together, the El Nino and the blob formed this <clears throat> marine heat wave that resulted in a decline in kelp growth. So what effectively happened after this double whammy of events was um, Pycnopodia were removed as a key link in the system. I mean, they are gone. Um, and as a result of the marine heat wave, kelp productivity declined. And so up and down the coast, we saw these outbreaks of purple sea urchins. And so this is just a little bit of background information. Um, what I'm gonna do now is I wanna jump into talking specifically about sea urchin behavior. Um, what's the deal with urchin behavior and why is it so important? Um, and so earlier, you know, Kate mentioned that um, these spiny sea urchins are a native grazer um, in kelp forests. 
Um, and sea urchins eat kelp, and this is a very normal thing for them to do. Um, but there's actually these two fundamentally different ways that sea urchins acquire kelp. So normally, in a kelp forest, sea urchins are tucked away in these um, cracks and crevices, and they're capturing this detrital kelp um, that's drifting by. And by doing this, um, sea urchins are actually um, filling the role of a detritivore. This kelp is not living. It's already detached from the main kelp, and it's just kind of drifting along the reef surface. Um, and so by doing this, they're, they're essentially detritivores. Uh, but when there's not enough of this drift kelp available, then sea urchins are known to actually emerge from um, those cracks and crevices and start actively grazing. And this is um, often considered a destructive form of grazing because the urchins are roaming on, on the reef surface looking for any remaining live kelp or other live macroalgae that they can find. So there's really these two fundamentally different ways that they acquire their food. They're either passively grazing where they're tucked in the, in the crevices eating that drift kelp, or um, they are out on the reef surface actively grazing. Um, and so just to expand a little bit more, um, when urchins are passively grazing and they're tucked away in these rock crevices, um, this, is, this is typically what we find in a kelp forest. And it's the ideal place for sea urchins because number one, they're hidden from predators because they're tucked away in these rocks where they're hard to, hard to get. Um, the pizza is being delivered to them, so they don't have to go looking for their food. The drift kelp is literally being delivered um, to their homes in these crevices, so they don't have to go searching for their own food. And consequently, this results in really healthy urchins. Um, and so you can see that in the photo here, this urchin is full um, of gonads. And so urchins that are passively grazing are just investing all of that uh, energy that they acquire from the drift kelp into reproduction. But when urchins switch to this active grazing mode and they emerge from crevices in search of food, um, their health condition rapidly deteriorates. And here's a photo of an urchin I took in the lab from a barren. Um, and believe it or not, this urchin, um, before we dissected it, was alive. And it's, it's remarkable how these animals can survive in this starved state where they are nearly empty for a really long period of time, perhaps years. So the question here then is what causes this behavioral switching? What causes urchins to leave their crevices and go searching for food? And so here, um, the double whammy of events that we had, the sea star wasting event and then the marine heat wave, actually provided this really um, natural case study of what causes urchins to shift their behavior. So I showed this graph earlier, and um, I just want to point out again that before sea star wasting, so before 2013, um, pycnopodia were just never really that abundant to begin with here. Um, and now they're completely gone. We haven't seen any individuals in the last several years, not even any juveniles. I mean, they are gone. Um, and interestingly, shortly after um, the sea star wasting event, we saw this massive outbreak of purple sea urchins. Um, they didn't have a predator. Um, so they didn't have to worry about this big giant sea star lurking around, but they also didn't have very much drift kelp because of the marine heat wave. So they left their crevices in search of food. Um, now, I mentioned that Pycnopodia is never really abundant to begin with. So we think that urchins are just really scared of this predator. Um, and, what they, and to tease that apart a little bit more, what I mean is that there may not have been a lot of direct predation on sea urchins happening but the urchins were just afraid, right? So they didn't leave the crevices because there was this big sea star lurking around. But as soon as that sea star was gone um, and there wasn't enough food, then all of these urchins came storming out of the crevices. And so here I wanna show 
um, how we know that it was this behavioral shift or why we, why we think it was this behavioral shift. So here I'm showing the number of sea urchins that we recorded three years before the sea star wasting event and then three years after. Um, and so each panel here is a single year. Um, and these are, these are the different sizes of urchins that we record. So notice how up until 2013, we never really counted very many urchins. But then in 2014, this is after the sea star wasting event, look what happened. I mean, check this out. So there was this dramatic increase in counts of sea urchins on our dive surveys. But notice importantly, that they're not small. These urchins are between three centimeters and uh, seven or eight centimeters. So the average size of urchins that showed up in 2014 was about five or six centimeters. These are not juvenile urchins. These are adult purple sea urchins and they don't get that big overnight. So they had to have shown up from somewhere. Now, there could have been a couple other things that happened. So um, one alternative hypothesis is that maybe it was recruitment. So, um, you know, and again, I want to highlight that I'm talking about the central coast of California here. There could have been recruitment happening in other places. But here, if there was a major sea urchin recruitment event, then over time, at some point, we would have expected to see a spike in really tiny urchins, but we never did. Um, however, in 2013, there was this sea star wasting event. And the year after, all of these really large urchins showed up and noticed that it continued. So in the years following, there continued to be more and more large urchins. And so this is why we think that there was this really dramatic fundamental shift in the behavior of urchins, where before the sea star wasting event, they were so tucked away in crevices that we just never counted them. We could never find them. But then after, they really came out of those crevices and they became more detectable to divers. But they, importantly, they were there the whole time. Okay, so just to recap this first part here, um, the there's really two take homes here. So number one, here on the central coast of California, there's, there's no evidence of um, increased sea urchin recruitment. Um, so the, the urchins likely emerged from refuge following the loss of Pycnopodia and that decline in drift kelp. However, because Pycnopodia were never really that abundant to begin with, um, it suggests the second point here that um, sea urchins are just really afraid of this predator. And also, um, food is so important. And so when there was not enough drift kelp to keep the urchins happy, tucked away in the rock crevices, then boom, they had to come out looking for food. Okay, so um, I just covered um, some, some really kind of new research on sea urchin behavior. And so now I'm going to build on what I just described about sea urchin behavior um, to talk about the response of sea otters and importantly, what the otter response means for the fate of kelp forests. And so here, um, this study comes from the southern end of Monterey Bay in California. Um, and this part of the coastline um, that I'm referring to for this portion of the talk is only a few kilometers of coastline. Um, and so those of you familiar with this area, the Monterey Bay Aquarium is kind of right here. And then um, th this is Pacific Grove and then Point Pinos. And so again, this is just a few kilometers of coastline. Um, and on the next slide, I'm going to show um, some maps of the extent of barrens and kelp forests along this part of the coast. But the thing to remember is that land is kind of in the bottom left corner here and the ocean is um, in the top right. Okay, so here I'm showing the extent of sea urchin barrens and kelp forests around this area. So on the left panel here, um, this is showing sea urchin density along the Monterey Peninsula. So notice the areas in purple. These are places where there's a lot of urchins. These are barrens without a doubt. 
But then there's these areas adjacent that are in blue where there's hardly any urchins at all, at least that we could see. Um, and so what you'll notice here is that the Monterey Peninsula, as Kate mentioned earlier, is really patchy. There are these patches of barrens and forests. And um, like Kate's slide earlier, you could see that on a single dive, you might be swimming through a barren and then do a kelp forest and then into another sea urchin barren. And so it's really patchy. Um, and that's evidenced here, not just by sea urchin density, but by kelp as well. So the second panel here shows the extent of kelp forests along the Monterey Peninsula. And the areas in green are places where there's a lot of kelp and the places in yellow are places where there's no kelp. And so here um, are a few photos of these locations. So notice again how these sea urchin barrens um, have no kelp and, and there's a lot of urchins, but then there are these adjacent forests um, where there's no urchins out roaming on the reef surface. Okay, now the final um, dimension I wanna show here is sea urchin condition. So I mentioned earlier that these actively grazing sea urchins, or urchins have this active grazing mode and this passive grazing mode. So check out urchin condition. The areas in, in this dark red or dark orange are places where the urchins are really healthy and they come from kelp forests. But then there are these adjacent areas where there's no kelp and the urchin condition is terrible. Um, this is, oh, I think I have these photos here. Yep, I do. So again, here's a photo of an urchin that came from a patch of forests. And here's one that we dissected from a patch of barren. So this is, I mean, it's night and day. The urchins in forests are super healthy. The urchins in barrens are completely starved out. So what's going on with the otters? What are the otters doing about this? Um, I'm showing the same maps here, but now I'm including these black points, which are places where otters are targeting sea urchins. And so each of the black points on the map here um, represent places where otters made repetitive dives for sea urchins. Notice how the otters are just pounding the urchins in patches of forest that are really healthy. Um, and this is because the urchins there in those patches of forests are really healthy and they provide a lot of nutrition for the otters. However, the otters are just about completely ignoring urchins that are starved in barrens. And so, of course, there's this huge barren right in the middle here, but then you'll notice that there's other places along the Monterey Peninsula where there's yellow and there's just really not a lot of otter foraging happening there. So otters are preferentially targeting those really healthy urchins and patches of forest and just about totally ignoring those that are in sea urchin barrens. The other thing that's interesting um, is that after the urchin outbreak, we actually saw a dramatic increase in the number of otters along the Monterey Peninsula. So uh, starting in 2014 is when the urchin outbreak really ramped up. And just to be clear, as I showed earlier, these urchins probably emerged from refuge. And so here the top panel is showing the density of exposed sea urchins. And the red line here demarcates the urchin outbreak that began in 2014. So now notice the year following that there was this dramatic increase in the number of sea otters along the Monterey Peninsula. And this was far and away um, a larger increase in otter abundance than the 14 years preceding the outbreak. So this is, I mean, this is really fascinating because um, as soon as there was this abundant prey source available, um, we saw that translate into the number of sea otters along the Monterey Peninsula. But as I just showed in the previous slide, they actually became really selective in where they were foraging on sea urchins. Um, now, the other thing here too that um, I think is really interesting is um, we wanted to know just did otters increase their urchin consumption, right? So, I, so I, just, I just got through showing where otters were eating urchins um, and that there are more otters, but um, we wanted to know, were they just eating more urchins in general? Um, and it turns out that in fact, yes, um, the contribution of urchins in sea otter diets dramatically increased. 
Um, and in fact, the proportional contribution at least doubled um, since before and then after the sea urchin outbreak. Um, however, some sea otters are known to specialize on individual prey items. Um, and we found that the urchin specialists continued to eat about 40% of their diet on urchins, whereas it actually went up in otters that do not specialize, or rather did not specialize on urchin prey. Um, but the other huge change is that the frequency of urchin specialist sea otters in the population nearly doubled. So the overall increase in consumption is probably driven by the addition of new urchin specialist otters to the population. Um, and we think that these were mainly uh, sea otters that were born after the urchin boom into this new urchin dominated environment. And so the big so what here, um, all of this collectively means that the sea otter preference for um, energetically profitable sea urchins, the really healthy sea urchins in patches of forests, um, which is a function of urchin behavior, um, really underpins the forest patch resistance to overgrazing. And so sea otters are helping to maintain remnant patches of kelp forests within this mosaic landscape. And so collectively, there's really three lessons that we've learned following this catastrophic sea star event in the marine heat wave. Number one, um, the loss of kelp and the loss of the sea star predator of urchins led urchins to shift their behavior from being these passive grazers to actively roaming on the reef surface looking for live kelp. Um, and that active sea urchin foraging behavior is associated with a decline in urchin health. And then importantly, across this mosaic of barrens and forests, um, sea otters preferentially target those healthy urchins in patches of forests, um, but mostly ignore those that are in sea urchin barrens. And by doing that, sea otters are helping to maintain remnant patches of kelp forests amid this widespread sea urchin outbreak. Okay, that's all I have. Um, in a few minutes, I think there'll be time for um, a Q&A and, and a discussion, I hope. Um, but I'm also happy to answer any remaining questions through one of these channels. Um, and once again, I'd just like to extend a, a thank you to the Alaka Alliance for inviting Kate and myself today. Okay, thank you. I'm going to turn it back over to um, Chanel. Wonderful. Thank you both. I could watch your presentation again and again each time. I love it. All right, we have several questions that have popped up. Uh, first, several comments to Kate about your photography being amazing and great story presentation um, through your photos. So lots of love for you. Um, all right, a question. Let's see, from Kevin asks, besides urchin culling, what are other ways to restore the kelp forest balance? Sorry, is this a question for Kate? Yeah. Or no? Oh, either, whatever. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Whoever wants to. Uh... Be better set up for that one. <laughs> sure. Um, so just to, just to be clear, the question was, um, what other uh, what other methods could be employed to help restore kelp forests? Is that yes, besides that urchin question? culling? Yeah, right. So, um, so this is a really interesting question, right? And and this is something that's being talked about all over the place. Is what can we do? There's a number of things that are on the table. You know, there's some things that we that we know and we don't know. Um, Urchin calling is certainly a direct intervention, right? And so I think understandably, a lot of people are motivated to say, what can we do? And, and going out and removing urchins is something that's like, you know, yeah, we, like, we can go out and do this. And, you know, um, like Kate mentioned earlier, that's something that's being done now in a way to understand like how much effort that actually takes to, you know, is it feasible? Um, but also as we just showed, um, 
you know, there, there are things important for maintaining the forests and certainly predators can do that. We're hopeful that um, uh, if Pycnopodia recover here and, and when, um, that they won't be as choosy. And that's a predator that could perhaps um, reduce the number of sea urchins in the barrens. I think most people will agree that in order to restore kelp, you have to reduce the number of sea urchins um, or get them to go back to that passive grazing mode. Um, and so others are exploring both the potential for restoring um, Pycnopodia as a predator to help reduce some of those urchins. And there's also other things being considered like um, kelp seeding and, and out planting kelp um, to places um, in order to um, perhaps complement the urchin coaling efforts so that there's source populations of kelp nearby, um, but then also to kind of provide a subsidy so that, you know, once you have a standing kelp patch, it may be spilling these blades of kelp to other places that will make the urchins happy and then they'll go back into the premises. Sorry, that was kind of a long-winded answer. <laughs> Oh, that's a great answer. I guess that can tie in. Uh, Joyce asks, is it possible for sunflower sea star to re-enter the environment? And I think you kind of answered that. Or do you know anything about, I know there's researchers in Washington um, growing them for possible reintroduction, but go, go for it. Yeah, so there's, there's researchers up in Washington who are um, exploring the feasibility of cap breeding of sunflower sea stars um, to ultimately perhaps outplant them. We're still a ways away from that, um, but you know, I'm, I'm happy to see that those efforts are underway as a potential solution. Um, but it, uh, others have told me that Pycnopodia are starting to show up in places. Um, there are small individuals showing up in Alaska and British Columbia, I think perhaps even Washington. Don't quote me on that, but I but I think they're showing up there as well. Um, and the interesting thing about um, Pycnopodia is they they could return, um, and we just don't know if there are populations in some places that may have persisted through that event. Certainly, they had to have much farther north up in Alaska and British Columbia because we're starting to see individuals show up. So there must have been some adults that made it through. All right, Dab asks, what accounts for the differences in kelp forests and urchin barrens in Northern California as opposed to Monterey? Maybe it's a, Kate, do you wanna? Yeah, sure. Um, so as Josh explained, um, the patchwork that we have going on here is because the otters are actually having an impact on maintaining the little patches we have. There are no otters up in Northern California, so you there's no nothing being maintained. And even if you introduce otters right now, they wouldn't eat those starving urchins, as Josh was explaining. So the presence of the otters is a major reason why we're able to maintain these little patchworks. As well. The other thing, too, that's interesting um, is that in Northern California, um, uh, they're, they're bull kelp forests, right, which is a different species than here on the central coast. We do have a little bit of bull kelp mixed in with the giant kelp, um, but although these two regions are not that far apart geographically, um, and they, they appear to be similar in many regards, they're also very distinct in that up there on the north coast of California, it's bull kelp. Here we have the giant kelp, and on the north coast of California, there are no sea otters. Um, as Kate mentioned, but then here on the Central Coast, we do have sea otters. So interesting comparison between the, the you know, these two um, different locations. All right. Uh, somebody asked, wouldn't, uh, for Josh, wouldn't density stay the same after they left the cracks for urchins? Yeah. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, I will say that there certainly had to have been new individuals coming in in that, in that really small recruit stage, but it doesn't seem to have any really um, major effect from what we can see so far. But the reason that the density is different is because um, the, the increase in the number of sea urchins that we observed is because as divers, we're just not good at finding urchins that are way tucked in crevices. And I can tell you from working on other experiments that urchins will get under rocks 
Um, and when we're doing dye surveys, we're, you know, we're not turning over rocks and looking for sea urchins. We're using flashlights and we're looking, you know, a meter into a crevice. But if that crevice keeps going, which oftentimes it does, we have no idea what is back there. And in some of Kate's photos, you can see these urchins just packed into these really shallow crevices. Um, and here, I mean, the, the, the habitat is so three dimensional. So um, we saw an increase in the density, but remember those are the density of exposed urchins that we can actually count. If we could count all of the urchins that were there in reality by knowing the number that were in those crevices and under our rocks that we can never see, then we probably wouldn't have seen much of a change other than urchins still coming out, right? Because that's the key thing here, that urchins came out of those crevices. Yes, they can get their way into lots of little cracks on the reef. Uh, all right, uh, Cynthia is a bit confused, Josh, about what you meant by recruitment of sea urchins. Right, so um, by recruitment, I mean uh, new juvenile individuals joining. So. The interesting about sea, thing about sea urchins and many other animals that live um, in the ocean is that they have two life stages. They have the adult form and then they have a larval stage. And these larvae um, are drifting around in these ocean currents before they make their way back to the reef um, and then transform into their adult form. So um, throughout the whole presentation day, we were focusing on the adult spiny form, but there's also this larval stage when they're, when they're um, really young. Um, and so when I say recruitment, I mean that it's possible that there could have just been one year where for some reason, those larvae that were out in the open ocean, those sea urchin larvae um, just happened to do really well. And they all came into the near shore and um, turned into those adult purple, spiny purple sea urchins, and then here they are, now we see them. Um, but again, just like we have a hard time finding urchins that are tucked away in cracks and crevices, it's really hard to know the number of sea urchin larvae that are out in the ocean. And I mean, we have no idea. Yeah, that would be a very hard task to do. <laughs> uh, Michelle asks, are you connected with anyone on the California North Coast or at Humboldt State University who is looking into urchin bull kelp Sea otter, or lack thereof, dynamics. Yeah, um, and and we work really closely and collaboratively. Um, and so, you know, we've kind of touched on a lot of key questions. I don't know if you know if you have anything um, in particular in mind, but um, you know, these are really two interesting locations to compare because of the differences in the kelp species and the the presence and absence of sea otters. Um, and so. Um, we are working really closely with um, other researchers up and down the coastline of California. We haven't even touched on Southern California, which is um, also interesting to look at how kelp forests have changed along, um, you know, the whole entire Northeastern Pacific Ocean. All right, she asks again a different question. Um, can you share a bit about the behavioral difference between purple urchins living in the intertidal zone versus subtidally? And is it harmful to harvest intertidal urchins given this is not necessary, uh, the location of bull kelp forests? Yeah, this is, a, this is a really fascinating question because one thing that we saw on the northern coast of California was that um, when the urchin outbreak happened and the urchins ate all the kelp, we saw this huge migration of abalone, which also eat kelp, up into the inner tidal. Um, and those abalone were starving. There was no more food left for them in the subtitle. So they moved up into the shallow zone in search of food. Similarly, we've shown this that here in Monterey on the central coast of California, purple sea urchins, after they've, in, in some locations, not everywhere, but in some places on the central coast, after the urchins ate all the kelp, they moved way up into the inner tidal. I mean, they are uh, on the beach almost. I mean, they, they, uh, like almost out of the water. They are up in the inner tidal. Um, and uh, this is really interesting because there, you know, um, the, um, you mentioned that what's, the, you know, is it feasible to, to or what's the impact of, of collecting urchins, culling urchins in the inner tidal? Well, 
um, you know, we can, we can call urchins in the inner tidal more easily than we could in the subtitle because it's a lot of effort to mobilize divers to go out. Um, but in the inner tidal, you know, you're limited by the tides, but you can walk out there. But what's also interesting here too, is the inner tidal is really exposed to wave disturbance. And um, now that all these urchins are way up in the inner tidal, not everywhere, but in some locations, it'll be interesting to see if any big winter storms would physically dislodge those urchins that are up in the inner tidal. Great. Uh, Bob asks, how were red urchins affected? Yeah, so um, red urchins here, speaking again on the central coast, um, also dramatically increased. Um, and uh, we suspect that there is a similar behavioral response. Um, red urchins typically live deeper than purple sea urchins. Um, and that's because red urchins are much bigger. They have a lot of biomass and they are very susceptible to wave disturbance. Um, because they're just a bigger animal and they can get swept off the reef. So typically the red urchins live much deeper, um, but we did see um, an increase in, in red urchins as well. Um, and we've carefully looked to see kind of what's the major driver of kelp deforestation. It's purple sea urchins. I mean, red urchins might have some effect. There's more of them out actively grazing, um, but it's really in deep, deeper water. Um, uh, but you know these barrens are just they're clearly dominated by purple sea urchins okay kate i have a question for you what kind of camera do you use underwater um i use a panasonic gh4 it's a nice little photo video hybrid it's a little dated now it's seven years old but it's a it's that one i'm a big fan of the mirrorless cameras and um it's one of those and they're pretty great these days they're getting better and better Super. Uh, you can probably answer this question. Dave is wondering if the sea star wasting disease is still present and is it limited in California or has it spread in Oregon and Washington? Yeah, um, it's still around, but in a lot more limited quantities. There are some sea stars that seem to have pretty recovered. Ochre sea stars are one of them that have seemed to develop and some kind of immunity to an extent to it. And so you'll see a lot of these guys looking pretty healthy around, but we still see them time to time getting twisted. Um, a couple like the giant spine stars and things like that. I've seen a couple recently that were twisted. So it's still around, but uh, yeah, Josh can add more to that if he has more info. Yeah, I mean, it. it um, I think Kate cap captured it accurately. I mean, there's still, it, it seems like disease, this disease symptoms are kind of out there. Um, but it's nothing like it was. I mean, in, in, in late 2013, the stars were just, they were just melting away. Um, it, 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 was, it was catastrophic, um, but some are recovering. Pycnopodia here is gone. I mean, we've just not seen any individuals, but earlier Kate showed that really cool video of the, the leather star, which is a known predator of urchins. Um, they don't eat urchins like Pycnopodia, um, but they're, making a recovery um, and um, along with some other species um, of sea stars. And so, um, you know, I myself, you know, Kate, Kate's out in the water a lot more than me, but um, I haven't seen really any clear symptoms of disease in, in a while. Super, Kate, how long have you been doing underwater photography? Um, underwater specifically, um, coming on maybe nine years now, um, all essentially all in Monterey, Carmel area, very little tropical. <laughs> um, Josh, this is probably for you. Do urchins get the disease or are they affected by the same sea star wasting disease? So this is an, a very active area of research right now. Um, it, it seems that the wasting syndrome that happened with sea stars is different than what urchins get, but urchins do, um, they are susceptible to their own disease. Um, and we see that as, as the symptoms of that are uh, spine loss um, 
and these black lesions that show up on the body of the test of the urchin. And so if you're out in the intertidal or if you're a diver and you're diving and you see that, um, email me uh, because we want to know about it. And we're really, we're really curious about how prevalent um, urchin disease is. And to that effect, um, you know, a, there was a question asked earlier about what can be done about um, restoration. And I'm, I'm not suggesting that we go out and we like outplant urchin disease, but disease is something that could occur somewhat naturally. And um, if there's like we have now a, a, um, a high density of urchins that are out there, right? There's just a lot of individuals um, and a disease hits, it could be catastrophic. Um, and it could rapidly um, take out a local population of urchins. Um, and I, I mean, disease is the kind of thing where we could go from having a bear in one year to no urchins in the kelp forest in the next. Yeah, one of my colleagues um, wanted us to mention that sunflower sea stars were wiped out all the way up the coast to British Columbia to Alaska too. So it's whole entire west coast region uh, that this affected. Uh, Nick asked, do sheephead fish predators play a big role? One of my favorite things to see diving in Monterey. They certainly eat urchins. Um, they, um, we see sheephead around Monterey, but they're more prevalent in Southern California. I'm curious if Kate has seen any actual predation by sheephead on urchins locally? No, yeah. Uh, most of the sheep, there aren't that many sheephead here, but we saw a few of them come in with that warm water, but, um, and they're all adults now, but they're still kind of rare. I've never seen one actually eat an urchin around here. Yeah. Uh, are there other sea stars that eat urchins besides the sunflower and the leather sea star? Um, there are, um, and locally we've looked at, we have several different sea stars, but there's really a few kind of really big ones. Um, Pisaster, which um, eats mussels right up in the intertidal, and they do extend a little bit into the subtital. Um, they, they probably eat urchins. If they, if they do, they, they probably um, have a preference for smaller urchins. Um, and in the lab, we've looked at we did some studies looking at Pisaster and they, they just didn't eat many urchins in the lab, um, but we looked at it some other species. Oh, I, I should mention, I'm sorry, that there's there's a few different species of Pisaster. There's Pisaster acracius, which is kind of up in their title, and then there's the giant spined um, sea star Pisaster that is deeper. And um, that's, that's a really common uh, Pisaster giganteus. It's a giant spined star. It's a really common sea star um, that is making a quite a recovery um, in the subtitle. Um, and in the lab, they did not eat a single urchin. I mean, the urchins were almost like, like they, the urchins weren't even scared of, of that sea star. So um, it's really fascinating. You know, I mean, I would say that far and away, Pycnopodia is the major urchin predator. I mean, they, they eat urchins and urchins are really scared of them. And then second to those, I would say, are, the leather star. And then after that, it's, it's a little bit unclear. So I guess big question, in the long term, can kelp forests truly recover without sea otters? Right. Um, can kelp forests recover without sea otters? So um, I, you know, I think that most people will agree that I think I mentioned this earlier that we have to either reduce the number of sea urchins to get kelp back or get those urchins to just go back to being passive grazers, um, which requires there to be kelp. Um, and here, you know, this is gonna be really interesting, right? So on the North coast of California and other places where there's no sea otters, but there, there used to be Pycnopodia, um, it'll be curious to see if that one predator alone um, could restore kelp by reducing the number of sea urchins. Um, and so without sea otters, you know, there's a lot of things that are being considered. Um, and that includes both direct intervention 
where humans go out and manually remove urchins. Um, and then also um, things like kelp outplanting, the restoration of other natural predators like sea stars, um, Pycnopodia. Uh, so time will tell. Okay, I've oh. got one Sorry. more. Sorry, I know we're a little over time. So yeah, thank yeah, you. Yeah, I know. Still sticking here. We still have a lot of people signed in. So that's a good sign. Uh, how long before starving urchins die off? Um, I know that you mentioned perhaps years, the ones that just keep continually grazing, uh, basically with zero gonads. So do you have an estimate or is research being done on that? Um, there's been some studies that have shown, uh, I, I mean, in other places, they can survive perhaps for multiple years, 10 years, 20 years. I, I, I don't think we really know. Um, but it seems that they can really persist in that starved state for just a really long time, mul multiple years at least. Um, and what's interesting is that when they go into that starved state, they can just kind of really slow down and go into this sit and wait mode where, um, you know, Kate showed some great photos of it earlier of how the urchins actually bore into the reef. And they're, you know, we see that a lot in barrens where they've scoured out the rock and they're, they kind of just make their own little place where they sit and wait. Um, and it's really hard to reverse barrens at that point because if any kelp shows up, they just gobble it up right away. And they can just persist in that starved state for so long. Is there any evidence of heat tolerant kelp that you know of? That's a really good question. Um, and there are some other researchers who are more knowledgeable of that, about that in particular, and there's a, about that, that area in particular, there's kind of a critical threshold of nutrient requirements and temperature that kelp can't live beyond. Um, but certainly exploring kelp that are uh, more uh, resistant to warmer water um, is, is like the future. <laughs> and there's a lot of people who are researching that question uh, specifically. Mm -hmm. uh, Kate, do you have a favorite dive location in Monterey? Oh, that's a hard one. But uh, Monterey proper, probably um, the Monterey breakwater. This is the dive site in Monterey. It's where all the divers get trained. I've dove it probably a couple hundred times, but it, it, it's always changing and it's always so cool to dive there. And um, in the wider area, I would say probably in Carmel and North Monastery is one of my favorites. Um, that's just, just a beautiful dive site. Yeah, and Breakwater is where I got my uh, night dive, my first oh, night nice, dive. Yeah. yeah, a lot of training goes on. It's very easy to dive site, but it, it never gets old. There's just so much to see there. Mm -hmm. uh, all right, I think. I think that's it with the rolling of questions. Thank you so much, Josh and Kate, for joining us this evening. And I know they shared uh, their contact info and I'll send out a follow-up email with the recording of this webinar uh, tomorrow so I can send their um, contact information in that email if you have any more questions or wanna check out their Kate's photography or Josh, Josh's research. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for joining us. We have several uh, upcoming webinars. We have a crabinar talking about Dungeness crab and otters on July 8th. We have one on art, science, and kelp forests on July 20th, and then one on July 26th about Pacific Northwest River otters. So check out our website if you want to register for that. And with that, I guess have a great weekend. Stay cool. I know much of the country is going to be very, very hot. <laughs> so stay hydrated and have a great weekend, everyone.